Good morning, RCC family. This Christmas, we are helping connect others to Jesus. Isn't it awesome that we get to be part of it, that he doesn't do it excluding us, but we actually get to be part of the process. And that's one of the things I love about that video that we just watched, because it was just a simple moment. His mind was blown. And we have a lot of different misunderstandings and misgivings, and there's a lot of people around us that need us to be able to connect the real Jesus to what they have seen, what they have heard, and then to take away the things that they've heard about them that are incorrect. And we get to be a part of that process. And so this morning, we are in a series called Holy Moments. And I want to just start by reading you a quote from this book, and then we're going to pray and begin. But I want to read it. It's up on the screen. And it says, A holy moment is a single moment in which you open yourself up to God. You make yourself available to Him. You set aside personal preference, self-interest, and for one moment, you do what you prayerfully believe God is calling you to do. Will you just bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Father, I thank you so much for loving us and inviting us to experience your goodness and allowing us to be changed by your goodness. And then we get to participate in sharing that with others. Holy Spirit, I pray that you do what I cannot do. I pray that hearts would be freed this morning, that they would experience mercy and your amazing grace. And all God's children said, amen. Amen. Well, I just want to welcome you, those of you that are joining us live streams, live streams, live stream. It's like Meyer, you know, we had an ask to it, live streams. Um, my name is Pastor Sarah. I'm one of the executive pastors here this morning. And so we're jumping in. Pastor Richard gave, started us off on our Holy Moments uh, series last week, talking about moments that we get to be a part of where the Holy Spirit can flow through our lives, that we can touch other people. And I really believe the Christmas story is filled with holy moments, where human beings got to participate in something so monumental, so life-changing that we are still experiencing the results of their small choices to say yes to God. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, we're going to open up to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to start in verse 18. But before we do, I just got to open up with just one crazy story, okay? All right. It's 11.05. I'm looking at the time. I just want to let you know I'm recognizing the time. All right. I have to do that because I might think I'm doing the right time, and then I forget when I started, so I never know when to end. All right. So my family, we went up. We were looking for a place to go on vacation. Everything was sold out because it was a last-minute thing. And so it was like Labor Day weekend. It wasn't quite cold yet. It wasn't warm. We were like, what are we going to do? Found the best deal at a ski resort. All right? Okay, what are you going to do at a ski resort when there's no snow? Well, they had activities. All right? So we were like, all right, it's not warm enough to go swimming, but we can do their other activities. There was mountain biking with three kids under the age of 16 at that time. Can I tell you, mountain biking on a ski resort is a fail. Not a good idea. We had kids crying. We had kids saying this is the worst vacation we've ever done. I mean, it is not fun to try to go up a mountain when you've actually never done mountain biking. So that was a fail. So we're like, hey, that's not good. So we're like, you know what? There's another thing they're offering. And that is these like toboggan rides, but they're more like a luge. Okay, so you like get in, you go up, you take a chairlift to the top of the mountain, and then you get into this thing, and it's like kind of half encloses you, but you're not like actually strapped in. And there's this lever that makes you be able to go faster or slower. It's actually a brake, I think, but um, it was to me, it was like faster or slower. So the kids are super excited. We're going down the black diamond side of this mountain, okay? And we're just, you know, it's this awesome thing. And so they're not giving us any instructions other than just, you know, use the brake when you're going down when you need to slow down. And so I'm thinking, you know what? If they're not telling us any other instructions, we can just go full throttle and just have fun. 
So Jude goes down first, Ben and Julia go down, and then Josie, and then I'm coming up on the rear, and I'm thinking, this is going to be awesome. Like, this is, you can go as fast as you want to, and, and it, they're just going to let you fly down this hill. You can't even do that skiing. At least you're not supposed to do that skiing. You're supposed to turn so you're not, you know, going to kill anybody. Um, we're still working on that with our kids. But we are, so I get into this luge, and I mean, it's, it's, like not cold. So I'm not like in snow gear, you know, I got short sleeve shirts on and probably jeans. And so I jump in this thing and all I remember is sitting down and I'm thinking as fast as I want to. And so I get in and I literally just push the thing full throttle. I'm like, we're going. So I am just flying. And I get to this curve in my mind at one point says, you probably should slow down. But I'm like, no, they didn't tell me to. I can go as fast as I want, and, they're not, and I, I'm going to be safe because they would have said slow down at the turns. So I did not break at all. I kept the whole thing full throttle, and I am flying. And then, I kid you not, at one point, I feel myself flying off the track into the woods that are near me. This happened so quickly that it was like a blink of an eye. And all of a sudden, I am on the ground. I'm scratched up all over the place. And a man that I didn't even know existed is running to me. I didn't even know where he was. I'm like halfway in the, I'm like in the mountain. And this man is like, this has never happened before. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, I mean, you didn't tell us to slow down. And he was like, what were you thinking? And I said, you just told us to break if we wanted to. And so I'm like, I thought it was safe to go. And he's like, this has truly never happened. I don't actually know what to do right now. <laughs> so him and I, he did eventually ask if I was okay. And um, so him and I actually pick up this metal sled thing put it back on the track. And when I tell you that we had to put it back on the track, it, I, so I didn't realize it when I was going down, but this thing actually had like this giant curve. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like a, like a wall. So I should not have flown out. So we don't know how, it was like quite a thing to lift it back on, to put it, and he looks at me and goes, do you want to finish the ride? <laughs> well, I paid for it. Let's do it. <laughs> So I got back on and I went flying down the hill. My kids were all like, oh, we saw you goes flying out of the thing. Like they thought I was dying. I mean, it was, I mean, I was pretty messed up, but I did get to go full throttle. And I thought about when I was reading the passage of scripture in Matthew, and as I was reading the Christmas story about how there's moments in all of our faith journey, there are moments in our lives where we feel like we know where we are headed and we know where we're going, our faith is secure, and then we make a decision and we find ourselves flying off the track. And how important and valuable are the people that are hiding in the woods <laughs> that are there to help us get back on track? Right? That man, I never even knew that he was there. I did not know that he was valuable. I didn't know that what his job was was important. But in a moment when I got off track and I needed somebody to just take a little bit of their time and care, he made all the difference in me being able to finish my ride. And in our faith journey, church, we all need moments where people will be that to each and every one of us. And then we are able to participate and do the same for someone else. Amen. So let's read Matthew chapter 1. And I want to just look at this passage of scripture because I believe there are so many things. But there's three things, three holy moments that Joseph gave in this passage of scripture that I feel like the Holy Spirit is challenging me and just all of us to continue to grow and release these moments for other people. Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, it's on the screen. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'll just keep going. <laughs> I was following you. There we go. All right. I can't read that small. Thank you. All right. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. 
So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Next one. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from all their sins. Verse 22, all this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Next slide. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. So there are three holy moments that I want to highlight this morning that I believe Joseph gave to Mary it was a gift, a gift that helped her keep on track, a gift that helped her to finish out the things that God had called her to do and her walk with the Lord. And the first holy moment that I believe Joseph created for Mary was behind the scenes. It was like that man hiding in the woods, probably sitting in a little hut, probably doing his job, thinking I've never been needed before. What's the point of me sitting here and watching and making sure everyone's okay? You see, he was doing his job being faithful when I didn't even know it. And Joseph, I believe the very first gift, the very holy moment that he created for her was all behind the scenes. And the first moment, I, or first holy moment was he gave mercy instead of judgment. Joseph gave mercy instead of judgment. The Bible says that he did not want to disgrace her publicly, so he decided to break the engagement quietly. I think this is so amazing because mercy is getting what you don't deserve. When we read this story, we know that Mary was impregnated by the Holy Spirit. But could you imagine meeting with your fiance and having this conversational moment? Okay, when I was 14 years old, I literally was tormented with the idea that what if God did that to me? Okay, I didn't think that Jesus was coming back again through another child. But when I read this story, I so empathize with this amazing, this, I mean like, we're like, oh, amazing Mary. I'm thinking this girl had to be like, am I crazy? You know what I'm saying? It probably wasn't until her stomach started growing that she even believed that it was real. She was like, well, I know you're an angel. I'm going to say your will, not my will be done. I'm saying yes. But Lord, this is an act of faith because I really could be crazy, right? Because she had never done, this has never been done before. And Joseph is having a conversation with the woman that he believes is righteous, that he is saying, I want to do life with you. I'm committed to be in a covenant relationship with you. And she drops the bomb. But then instead of saying, well, I cheated on you, she says, well, I'm pregnant, but it was by the Holy Spirit. What type of man at that point would want to respond and still want to honor this woman? Mercy is giving something, giving someone what they don't deserve. You see the law in that day, Deuteronomy, I think it's in chapter three, the law says that if a woman breaks off when you're betrothed, when you're married, and she cheats on her husband, then legally and out of the law, he is obligated to stone her. And yet this man still thought highly enough of her, or maybe he was just so honorable of a person himself that he said, you know what? My feelings might want justice. I might want things to be fair and made right, but I am going to do the honorable thing, and I don't want to take out and bring another area of destruction even after what you chose to do. Church, that is mercy. Mercy. 
Our feelings, when we have been betrayed, when we have been done wrong, when there is misunderstandings, our natural gut instinct is to want revenge and to want justice, right? It is a knee-jerk reaction. And this is, a, is, this is the moment that he looks at her and says, you know what? I am not going to choose to view you through this lens. I don't understand it. Because he was still going to divorce her. But he says, I'm going to release mercy and I'm not going to publicly humiliate you. And I'm not going to call for justice. Right. Church true forgiveness starts with mercy. Haven't we all received mercy? I find it so interesting that Jesus with the Beatitudes, one of the things that he started with in the Beatitudes is he said to the merciful, blessed are the merciful for they will receive mercy. When I think about this concept, I think about how often in life am I carrying around baggage from the past because I'm not willing to release mercy. You see, 1 Corinthians 13 describes love and its different attributes. And one of the things that 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says is that love always hopes. It's one of the parts that I just want to skip over. Like when referring to God, I'm like, that's good. I got hope in Jesus. But can I tell you that sometimes when I'm looking at human beings and when you go through the same hurt over and over again and you're constantly disappointed, you're not thinking, oh, love always hopes. Because to hope means to believe the best. Hope means to see somebody the way that Christ sees them. And so because Christ can be involved in this, there is hope regardless of what this person is doing or continuing to do. Love always hopes. And that is a gift that is supernatural. It is not something that we possess on our own. But we see Joseph in this moment behind the scenes, not even in front of Mary, giving this gift of mercy that is allowing her to fulfill the call of God that is on her lives. Amen. Now, I don't know what you believe or not believe, and I'm just going to throw this out there. The law said he could have killed her. Church, what if Joseph immediately responded and called for justice? He would have killed the very one that he had been praying for, for salvation. Is it possible that there are times in our lives that we cry out for justice and we cry out for revenge and we move and we act upon our feelings and we act upon the things that we are justified to do and we actually stop the very blessings and the answers to prayer that God actually already has set in motion. I do believe God would absolutely create another way. I do believe he would have intervened. He's sovereign, but he gives us free will and we participate. Right. Mercy is a gift that releases blessing and freedom in our own lives. Joseph experienced mercy from the Son of God and from forgiveness of sins and eternal life because he released mercy that day to Mary. Mercy is not sweeping things underneath the rug. He dealt with it. But even though he was treating her with honor, he still said there are consequences that need to take place. Forgiveness is not just forgiving and forgetting. Forgiveness is treating someone the way that you've been treated by Christ. But there's still consequences. And I just want to make sure because so oftentimes we feel like God is asking us to do something the impossible. Where God is asking us to forgive. God is asking us to extend mercy. And where he's saying, but that's not right. God has never called sin right. There are consequences. Joseph was still going to walk through the consequences, but he was going to do it with mercy. We cannot dehumanize people during hard situations. We have to continue to fight people the way that God sees each and every one of us. 
The second holy moment that I saw that Joseph gave to Mary that day was he gave a response instead of a reaction. Joseph gave a response instead of a reaction. Scripture says, as he considered this, as he considered his plan to divorce her quietly, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. When I was reading this passage of Scripture, I thought how oftentimes that I ask the Lord for wisdom and realizing that I've already gone ahead and done what I thought needed to be done. Right? Right? So oftentimes I am frustrated because I'm like, James promises me wisdom, and yet the Lord has been reminding me, but you're not sitting and waiting. It was when he was considering, it was when he made time for his feelings and for his emotions, his natural tendencies to cool down, that we can begin to think more clearly and respond without adding more damage to what already has been done. This is a holy moment to ourselves and to others. James 1.19 says, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because our human anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Church, even when we're justified, even when we've done wrong, If we want God to be a part of this and to bring healing where it just seems impossible, we have to make and set aside time for a holy moment where we say, I want to cool down. I cannot just change this on my own. Lord, this is painful. This is confusing. I need your perspective. Proverbs 14, 29 says, whoever is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has hasty temper exalts folly. We've got to create moments to consider things. Consideration is a holy moment that we give to others when we take time to wait on the Lord for direction. Think about this. Before Joseph made time to consider, what were his options? Stone her, justice for the law, or his idea. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to treat her honorably. I'm going to still treat her with mercy. But the second option is, is I'm still going to divorce her quietly. Have you ever been in a season of life where you just are like, man, both options stink? Right? Like you sit, you make lists, you talk to others, and you're like, man, none of these options work. Can I tell you, so often in times, it's because we're not inviting the Lord into the situation. Because without the angel's intervention, without God coming in in a dream and speaking to his beloved son Joseph, there would have never been a third option. Because the third option was supernatural. The third option came from God's perspective of the story instead of just man's understanding. And church, there are situations in all of our lives and continue to be that God has a third option. That we need to sit and wait for him to speak and give revelation and give the grace to be able to bring restoration to hard situations. It was a holy moment that Joseph gave to Mary, but also to himself because he got to participate in this amazing plan of redemption for all humanity. He got to be a part of this story because he waited on the Lord for another way. I love what um, Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding, but seek his will in all you do and he will show you what path to take. Church, God has another way. Human understanding is not meant to solve all the problems. Because human understanding is what normally got us in the problem in the first place. 
We need a third option. And the third holy moment that I see in this passage of scripture is this. Joseph not only gave mercy instead of judgment, he gave a response instead of a reaction. But number three, Joseph gave relationship. He chose to believe what God said about her and he went and married her anyway. The scripture says when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. There are certain things when you go through hard times and when we go through misunderstandings and when we go through relational issues in life, because you know what? Relationships are real and they're messy at times. But one of the greatest gifts that we can give is when we make a decision after the Lord speaks to us that we make a decision that our thoughts are going to agree with what the Lord has said and we settle it in our hearts. One of the greatest gifts, you see, we can feel, the human heart can perceive if you're feeling something different to me than what you're saying. Kids are amazing at this. Kids can perceive this so quickly. If a teacher is for them and believes in them or a coach is for them and believes in them, they will rise to the occasion. They will shine. But a kid that feels like their teacher doesn't believe in them, they just want to quit. Josie, our oldest, had a life-changing experience first through fourth grade. She struggled with school. More importantly, she struggled to feel like she was winning in any way. And every single conference, every single time I would go and meet with her teachers, it was the same thing. They would list all of their struggles and the same thing. I just don't know how to motivate her. And Ben and I would say, neither do we. (laughs) It was the same thing. And it was always this discouraged, like this resign, like, okay, there's just no hope. But I saw something that was so interesting for our little girl for four years struggling with teachers that just felt like there was no hope. There was just no way. Nothing's going to change. The struggle's just going to be there. But something happened in fifth grade. In fifth grade, she got put with a lady named Mrs. Hay. And Mrs. Hay rocked and changed our daughter's life. I went to conferences halfway through the year. I was prepared to hear the bad news, prepared to hear all the things that we're struggling with. And she looked at me and she said, your daughter is amazing. And I said, she is? (laughs) I've never heard this from a teacher. I mean, we think she is. And she said, and she is so smart. I now have have her helping other students. And I was like, you do? And she said, and her grades are going great. And I'm thinking, how in the world did we think we were never even going to make it to middle school from first to fourth grade? And now we have a teacher in fifth grade. We went from failing to succeeding to now helping other people. Church, it is the power of having somebody believe in you. Somebody that is connected to you and saying, I'm going to rally behind you. I see what makes you tick and I'm going to speak life into you. Church, we all have weaknesses. We all have areas that we need to grow. There are going to be family members gathering together this Christmas that when you come in, you're just going to feel a little cringy and you're going to be like, ah, this is going to be difficult. Can I tell you that I believe the Holy Spirit is wanting us to create holy moments with our family, with our co-workers, with our friends, where we help them get back on track spiritually because of the other things in life that might have derailed them, but have somebody look at them and speak life and love and encouragement. There are so many people that have walked away from their faith because of hurts, because of offenses, because of disappointments with Jesus. Church, we know what that feels like. We've all been disappointed. We've all had prayers not be answered the way that we thought that they were going to. We all know what it's like to have misunderstandings. But church, God has given us mercy. And so can we be the ones that will extend mercy and grace to others? Can we choose to make an agreement and say that Jesus died for all sinners? He extended relationship to us when we were sinners. 
not when we were changed. And he didn't just extend a one little moment and then it was done. He actually invited us in to be his children. Oh, I love what this says. John 1, 12 says, But to all who believe in him and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. Galatians 4 sums it up so beautifully. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. Isn't that what we just read? God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God sent his spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. That's what we sang this morning. It's not because we did anything. It's because he extended mercy to us when we were sinners, and then said, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. And then he paid the price for our sin so that he could give us something, give us amazing grace to not only be forgiven, but then to be adopted, and then to be blessed, then to have a new identity, then to be changed and to walk in a freedom. Because the end of the verse says, you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you an heir. Amen. You see, Joseph just didn't make a small commitment to Mary and say, let's just get through this. He committed to a covenant relationship. This Christmas, I believe that God is calling for the gift of reconciliation. There are broken relationships. There's been hurts, there's been misunderstandings. And I feel like the Lord is calling the church to extend grace and mercy once again. To be able to say, I want to give what God has given to me and I want to release it to you. Yes. Yes, there are consequences. Yes, there are boundaries, but we can still release and give the gift of relationship. One of the things that I find interesting that we read at the very beginning, the Bible says, that Joseph married her, but he did not have sexual relations to it with her until Jesus was born. Can I tell you that to have healthy relationships, we have to have self-control. We have to have self-control with our thoughts. We have to have self-control with our reactions. We have to have self-control in the way that we continually say, God, I need you to be a part of this relationship. I need to set aside time to have time to consider, to bring you in. Holy moments are not just sudden. They're not just all of a sudden they're appeared. They're moments that we participate with. The Savior of the world was born because of a holy moment when a teenage girl said yes. A holy moment was created when her fiance said, I'm gonna believe what God says about you. I'm not gonna cry out for justice. I'm gonna stay in covenant relationship with you and be part of this story. And can I tell you that Jesus gives all of us the most amazing holy moment where he says, I extend to you everything. I find it so interesting that Joseph could have stoned a woman that was caught in adultery in his mind. And then we later find Jesus, his son, in the same situation. We reproduce who we are. Jesus was the son of God, but he was raised by a man. And I find it so ironic that just like our sins repeat itself, 
So does the amazing things that God does in our lives. They're put inside of our kids. They're put inside of our friends. They're put inside of our relationships because we model, we reproduce who we are. And so Joseph raised Jesus in such a way that when he was in the same one, yes, he was probably listening to the Father because everything he did, he was considering what God's way was. But it happened to look the very same way that his father modeled it years before. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. So this Christmas season, I want to read one piece of advice from our Holy Moments book. You can put it up on the screen. It says, if I could give one piece of advice, it would be this. Make choices this Christmas that are easy to live with. Make choices that you can look back on lovingly, like you do upon best of times with the best of friends. This Christmas season, let's give the gift of holy moments in our workplace, in our grocery stores, in our Christmas events, and in our homes. So here's the three questions that I will end with this morning. Number one, who is in need of mercy instead of judgment in your life right now? Your teammate, a coworker, a spouse, a family member, a stranger. Who, need mer- who needs mercy? And can you start the process of forgiveness today by surrendering them to the Lord and praying for them to experience God's redemptive love in whatever area of brokenness there is? Remember, forgiveness is not making things right. Forgiveness is surrendering them to Jesus. It's saying, God, I make the choice to release them from what they've done, but I'm surrendering them to you. Trusting you to bring healing in their lives in the ways so that it doesn't continue to repeat, but you're still trusting the end result to the Lord. He is the only one that can heal us. He is the only one that can make things right inside of our hearts. The second question is for you today as we close, what situation in your life do you need to make time to consider? To invite the Lord in to give his perspective and wisdom. And the third thing is, who is God inviting you to give a holy moment of relationship with this Christmas season? Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? God, I thank you so much God, I thank you so much 